All right, so I'm going to repeat that for the folks at home. I know that the folks at home probably don't have Python installed. You're not going to be able to follow along, but we're going to write an itty bitty program just for funsies. And I'm going to increase the font size. How do you do that? You can go to Options, Configure Idle. You don't want to change your font size, but I do. And so I can change the font size here. You can kind of customize it. This is not the only editor that you can use for uh, Python. You could even use something really primitive like Notepad or something, but then you'd be required to run it from the command prompt. And what's the command prompt? It's like the good old DOS days, right? You, know, you can run Python from there if you need to. Or if you're a Mac user, you're probably familiar with popping open the terminal. Any Mac users in here? Is that what you're going to be using? All right, so. I'm having trouble getting on the internet for some reason. Try your birthday again, just to prove it. Um, just what straight month, day, day, year, 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 year. Yeah. I mean, I believe you, but. It'd be funny if it were. Oh, no, I no, no, no. I know you'd already <laughs> tried it. Okay, we're going to have to send you to, uh, to IT services to get that resolved. So just watch along, right, for today. I mean, I could log you in with my account, no, that's okay. but let's uh, let's just watch for today. I think you can uh, even configure the colors and stuff like that if you like trying to make a black background. I'm not sure. The other editor, some instructors use PyCharm. It's kind of cool. It's a little bit more sophisticated, but like I said, Idle comes with every install of Python, so I tend to just use it. If you absolutely wanted to write some Python and you were stuck, you know, at Wendy's or whatever, you know, waiting for somebody to pick you up, you had to do some Python programming, you could go to your phone and Google up online Python 3. And like just hit take the top hit. And you get a Python editor and a little window that you could, you know, watch the results in. And that's kind of cool. The drawback is, is that you either have to create an account on this, you know, saving your files is a problem. What happens if the browser, you know, you close the window without saving the data or whatever. We're not going to do it this way, but you could. You could conceivably do it like this, and some people actually think it's kind of cool that they have that in that. I'd install it. I'd, I'd go, you know, I'd jump in, jump in fully. All right, so the shell, what's the shell mean? means that you can type in programming commands and get immediate responses like this. Age equals 10. Print parentheses, age plus 20, right? Now back when you bought Apple IIs and Commodores and other prehistoric machines like that, they would always boot to basic which is the same idea, it was a programming shell and you could write programs right then and there. And so a lot of people who bought those things wound up dabbling in programming. Nowadays, computers don't encourage you to learn programming, which is kind of a drag. So anyways, we're not going to write our programs in the shell. And the reason why is what if I made a mistake and my age was really something a little bit more than 10? Well, I can't change it, it's a drag, right? All I can do is, and, you know, if I came up here and I hit enter, it would try to repeat the command. And sure, I could change it, but then I would have to repeat this command as well. And, you know, uh, a program can be, you know, like 100, 200 lines long. And anyway, so we're not going to edit our programs in the shell. Well, then why did we launch idle? Because it's also a program editor. Let's make a program file. So I'm going to do new file. I'm going to do save as and call it lecture A, but notice what directory it sticks us in. It sticks us in a system directory. Python requires write access to this system directory, which is a real, you know, normally you don't want write access unless you're an administrator to a system directory. And that's not a philosophical problem, it's a real problem in as much as you can break Python to the point where it won't even run or install by saving your files with the wrong file name or, or messing something up by saving something to the system directory. I've had people do that and it can take quite a while to diagnose even. So um, I'm absolutely not going to save anything in the system directory. If you absolutely, if you absolutely wanted to do that, you'd want to make a subdirectory, right? You could make a subdirectory here. 
What I would do is I would make a subdirectory somewhere else, like in documents or desktop. I like the desktop. So I'm going to make a subdirectory called CIT1173, oh, wait, 1113, or you, know, you could call it programming or put your name on it or whatever you feel. And then I would drag that over to quick access. So it's real easy for me to get to in the future. And by the way, really good idea to have a flash drive because you could come in and your computer may, may be missing, right? You know, it crashed and they haven't replaced it yet. Or they had to reformat the drive and boom, you've lost all your programs. Now, I love flash drives. I love them so much that I buy them like, you know, once every couple of weeks because I keep losing them. So you know, your, your mileage may vary. I wish that these were attached to, you know, like Google Drives or whatever so I could just, you know, back up all my data really quickly like that. But anyways. It is a good idea to save your notes that you type in each day to another place because you're uh, right, your computer may not be here the next time you come in. On the other hand, you upload your notes if you're typing them in at the end of each lecture anyways, and so you do have recourse. You can go and get them again. What am I going to call it? I'm going to call it Lecture A. Why A? Why not Lecture 1? I label the lectures by letters and the homework by numbers so that there's no confusion about if I say program 10, did I mean the 10th lecture or did I mean the 10th program? Nah, I would refer to it as lecture G or whatever 10 is, right? You know, um, or I would call it, you know, homework 10, lecture G versus homework 10. Notice that it says save as type, not PY stands for Python. Something to note is that it's a real good idea to enable viewing extensions if you're using a, a Mac and on a PC, excuse me, on a PC. Because if you buy a Windows laptop and come home, then you won't be able to see file extensions. Well, what are file extensions? Those are those like three letter or four letter things, you know, at the end of a file name. And you know what they are, but you don't necessarily see them. By default, Windows hides them. If you go to your Windows directory, I mean, not your Windows directory, the program directory you just made and browse it. Does it have the extension there? Did somebody do that and tell me whether the student computers are set up that way. Yes. Yeah, okay. Software. Excellent. But at home, it might not be. And there's two ways to do to fix that. You're going to want to click View, and you can go into Options. And this is how I would do it. Change folder and search options. But you notice there's a thing right there that says File Name Extensions. It's possible, I don't recall, I didn't even notice that until, you know, yesterday, uh, that if you click that, it changes it for every window, every time. If it doesn't, you can go into Change Folder and Search Options. You saw where I did that, I clicked View, and then after I clicked View, I went over here to Options, Change Folder and Search Options. Then I clicked on View again, and for some reason, Microsoft decided that you want to hide your extensions for known file types. Those extensions are useful. Why? Because in some programming environments, some languages, if you create a program called Lecture A, it's going to create behind the scenes like five different files with the same file name, but they're going to differ by only by extension. And when you try to upload your homework, it's real easy to pick the wrong one. Python, not so much. You're probably only going to have like one file named Lecture A or whatever. Still. We're, we're learning not just Python in here. We're learning, right, general, general programming. Also, if you feel like seeing hidden files and hidden folders and stuff like that, hey, this is cool. Display the full path in the title bar. I'm going to click that just for funsies. Yeah, I like that. I like that. I'm going to recommend people do that from now on. All right. Why are we learning Python? Yeah, Python, you know, I asked my, you know, my programming friend, and he told me that it's a stupid language and nobody really uses it. Nah, it's an easy language. That's different from stupid. It's a very powerful language. It's used by a lot of companies. It's a good thing to have on your resume. It can be used for, you know, by, well, you know, that's why it's required for the, uh, for the cybersecurity folks, because you can write, you know, programs, port scanners, you know, to check for open ports and, you know, programs that access the internet and pull data in. And NASA uses it to diagnose the reams of information from the space probes and stuff like that. It is a good language. It's a powerful language. It just happens to have a pretty easy syntax. 
Why does it have an easy's index? Because programming languages have been around forever, but the first ones were incredibly arcane. And then they kept getting easier. But you know, the people who uh, invent programming languages are usually trying to fix a problem that they saw in prior programming languages. And so this guy happened to come up with a particular language with a really good syntax for learning programming. All right, so back to my program. Stop babbling and let's write a program. At the top of every programming file, we should add a comment block explaining what it is. If you do professional programming, you'll run into the situation where you're asked asked to modify somebody else's code and if they had it haven't added so-called comments to the code explaining what it is then you'll want to hunt them down and beat them up because you won't be able to figure out what the program's doing yeah. and it's worse you feel even more dumb when you go and you look at your own code that you wrote four or five years ago and you cannot figure out what it's doing so we're going to always comment our code just to get in a habit of commenting our code why don't we put our name at the, at the top you don't have to put Jeff Thompson. You might want to put your own instead. Um, write the class number and what this is. And usually you're going to want to put a description of the code. Now, you all don't really know what the description of the code is going to be because you haven't seen it yet. So I'm just going to say that this is an intro program. Right? It's an introductory program. And it's okay if you forget everything that I show you here when you walk out, but you will, you will memorize it. And by the way, the book, only the most recent version incorporated Python examples. Prior to that, it used like C++ and Java, and it still has those. And so MindTap has lots of stuff about C++ and Java as well. You can look at that and go, hey, yeah, that's cool, but you don't have to focus on it. Right. Don't be afraid of the fact that it's showing you syntax in other languages. Programming languages have a lot of common elements no matter what the syntax is. If you can write a for loop or a while loop in one, you can do it in, in just about any other one, and the particulars are different. And I mentioned while loop. Why don't we write a while loop? We're going to launch a rocket into space. So I'm going to set some variable, like algebra, equal to 10. And then I'm going to make it count down 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, blast off. It's repeating, right? It's printing a whole bunch of things in a row with the numbers. So I'm going to want to use a loop for that. While x is greater than 0, colon. So this means stay in this block of code until x changes and is no longer greater than 0. So what are we going to do in it? We're going to print these numbers, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. So we need an output, which is a print statement. Print, parentheses, the number, comma, quote, dot, 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 end quote, in parentheses. Now, it would work just as well if I didn't have this part, but I just want it to look prettier. So it'll say 10, dot, 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 9, dot, dot, dot. If we wanted to, we could probably even add a command that would make it wait a second between each printing. And then, you know, since it's supposed to print 10, 9, 8, 7, we need to modify the value of x so that it reduces by 1 each time. So I'm going to say x equals x minus 1. And a question, a good question that people often ask if I don't preempt them, are those spaces important? Didn't I see you somewhere else type them in without spaces? Yeah, you did. There's only certain times when spaces are important, right? If I deleted that space, it looks like a completely different word, Hylix. So I'm not going to remove that space. But I could remove that space, and I could remove that space. So it's kind of up to your taste how you like to see it. I add spaces when I'm typing stuff here to make it easy for you all to see in the back row. Doesn't mean you have to. All right. So the stuff that is indented means it's going to keep repeating as long as x is greater than 0. But once it's done, you know, I want it to say 3, 2, 1, blast off. I don't want it to say blast off every time. So it needs to be outside of the loop. How do you make it outside the loop? You backspace it. You unindent it so it's against the margin. Print, parentheses, quote, we have lift off exclamation mark end quote in parentheses
you know, and I could space this out. If I was writing professional code, I might be adding what's known as white space. White space is just, you know, blank lines and stuff like that to make the code easier to read. Like, you know, you double space a paper if your teacher lets you do that, or, you know, you put, you know, the um, blank line between all the paragraphs and an indention at the first line. You write, you try to make the book easier to read. You also try to make your code easier to read. Now, in some languages, indention doesn't matter. You can, it's optional or not, right? I could delete that, that tab in some languages. One of Python's quirks is that indention is extremely important. And if you mess it up, even by the littlest amount, like I have, you know, like that, it won't run. That's a drag. So certainly don't make that change. That's just one of the quirks of Python. Why do other languages care and this one don't, um, doesn't? because lots of other languages use different ways of marking off blocks of code. Now, don't type this because this is a syntax error, right? But some languages will do it like that. And if you have those things marking off the beginning and the ending of the code, the language wouldn't even require a good indention at all, right? You know, you could you know, do all this and it would work just fine in those languages. Now, you shouldn't. It's really lousy looking, but you can in those languages. Python indention is of paramount importance because it shows what block of code the code is in. And you'll get annoyed trying to figure that out sometimes, but very quickly it'll become second nature. All right, so I'm going to run the module. Source must be saved. OK to save? Yeah, sure. I wish it would save it every time I tried to run it, even without asking me. But all right, and so it did it. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, we have liftoff. Now, I've never done the thing where I made it pause a second each time. But I think that'd be fun. Let's see if I can figure that out like within a minute, because if not, it's a waste of our time. But after you run it, you can close the shell, because it'll reopen it when you run it again. So quite often, I like to do that just to start off with a clean slate for next time. What happens if you accidentally close your editor? No big deal. You just launch idle again. And idle has this recent files option here to make it really easy to pick back up where you were before. I mean, lots of editors do, right? But I also see a lot of students go to the trouble of clicking open and wandering to their file you know, directory. Save yourself some time. Go to recent files. All right, let's figure out if, how to make it pause every second. In most languages, it's called sleep. You want to put that program to sleep for a second. Oh. I tried sleep and it, it took it as an invalid syntax. Yeah, so we're going to have to import a library in order to get that to work. So we're going to have to add an import statement up to the top. Import time. Time.sleep. All right. So here we are getting way fancier than I originally included. But you know, languages don't have everything built into them. Usually, they're kind of stripped down, and then you import the modules that you need. Just like you go to the library and you get a book for stuff you don't know how to do. Import space time. Add that above the x equals 10. Now, I'm going to add a comment to this line explaining why in the heck I did that for the sleep function. All right, so now we're going to do time.sleep. And I think it's in milliseconds. Nope, in this language, it's in seconds. And so I'm going to sleep one second. So I just added this line here. Pause for a second, or pause for one second. One good reason for me to add comments is that it makes it easier for you to go back and figure out what I'm doing. One of the problems of typing in code is I'm not typing in from a script. And I do that on purpose. But it means that sometimes I jump up and I change something here, and then I come back down. And it can be kind of hard to follow along, right? So I try to make notes with comments of what I've changed. And in this particular case, it's those two lines. And as soon as it works for me, I'm going to pause and wander around and help you all. Hey, it's working. I'm impatient. I don't want it to count down from 10.
I wanted to start only three seconds into the process. So I'm going to change x equals 10 to x equals 3. All right, cool. All righty. Let me pause the recorder so I can walk around and make sure it's working for you. If you need to figure out what books are required for a class, you ought to be able to do that through Canvas by clicking on this thing that says Folet Discover. It ought to look like a book and it doesn't. Instead, it looks like, I don't know what that's supposed to look like. But if you click on that and log in with your student information or whatever it asks for, then you ought to be able to figure out what books you need for which particular class. I bet it'll even let you order it and let you go to the bookstore and pick it up. Or I just go to Rose Bookstore, Google that, and it'll take me there that way. But the Follett Discover puts it in an easier to read format. All right, so we've written our first program. We are ready to go earn a million bucks as programmers. But we've got to work through the syllabus first. So why don't we go ahead and do that? Right now when you open our class, it defaults, I believe, to the syllabus page. I hope it saved the attendance that I just took. I didn't see all the marks. Yeah, yeah, good, all right. So when you click home, it takes you to the syllabus. After this, I'm gonna change it so that it takes you to the module screen because the modules is gonna have our like week one, week two, week three layout. All right, so what are we gonna learn? Core concept of writing computer programs. Variables, decisions, loops, functions and objects. And if you know those concepts for this language, you're gonna know them and be like three steps ahead next time you learn another programming language. And usually a programmer, or even if you're not gonna go into programming full time, you're gonna wind up learning more than one programming language. It's not like you can just, it's kinda of like you're gonna own more than one car in your entire life. So the knowledge you gain in this class will be good for absolutely all of them. We will use a script programming language. You should ought to be able to understand by the end of class fundamental concepts and general principles of programming, such as loops, decision statements, and input output. 1.5 would be you ought to be able to ace the next programming course you take. Understand and create flowcharts and pseudocode. Now this is a part that students really usually don't like as much, but we gotta do it. Pseudocode and flowchart are used for like mapping out the logic because an experienced programmer can often just sit down because they already know the patterns involved. But even experienced programmers, or if you work in a company that requires code review or whatever, will sit out and draw the logic, right, you know, in order to figure complex problems out. And that's what flowcharts are for. And you're probably, you know, familiar with the concept. If I Google a flowchart, yeah, just like that. So we'll learn how to do that. And unfortunately, in flowcharting, you have to remember which particular shape goes along with which particular idea. So you have to know when to use a diamond versus a parallelogram. I usually just call it a tilted rectangle, you know, and you get counted off if you use the wrong ones. But on the other hand, it's not too hard to memorize because there's like only five different shapes you need to memorize. We use Canvas. You'll need to be able to log into Canvas. I'm thinking about it. You're going to want that phone number so that you can call them and ask them for help. They'll probably be able to reset your password, you know, within minutes, be my guess. You will need to have access to a computer capable of accessing the internet, and it's not really such a big deal anymore, right? Everybody has access to the internet. Some people want to do programming classes like with Chromebooks or whatever, and Chromebooks are cool, but uh, they can be difficult to do your programming on. On the other hand, you can always use those online compilers, like I just did Python, online Python 3, right? And it popped up a code editor. You can do the same thing for C++ and Java. Overall, you're going to want to install the programming tools on your computer. But if you can't, 
you can come and use the computers down in the, in the computer lab down the hallway, right? It's just that they're not open on weekends and not really convenient. So the way the class is broken down, 90s an A, 80s a B, 70s a C. Usually I don't curve the scores because usually I have a lot of people making A's, right? And so can't really curve the score up much higher than that. So like I said, the exams are not killer. Um, hopefully not, hopefully not, hopefully not. Required software, Python 3, I've mentioned that. Class policies, what are you responsible for? Attending the class, and I should put in parentheses, or watching the lecture afterwards you know, when you're home, if you don't attend it. Having an access, maintaining access to the software used. Please read the required text and handouts. Nobody gives out handouts anymore, but there are PowerPoints. Keeping up with the schedule and getting assignments in on time. Now this is really important because if you get behind on one assignment, you're not gonna be able to do the next assignment very well, which is gonna impact your ability to do the third assignment. Don't get to the point where you're a week, two weeks, three weeks behind even if I seem generous on accepting late homework. I usually allow a grace period, like, you know, at least of a day or two. But if you talk to me about it, right, you know, yeah, hey, I'm sorry, I had to go to Georgia, you know, uh, help my brother's estate do something. Yeah, so, you know, I understand that life comes up. Or, or you know, I'm going to be giving birth, right? Or, you know, <laughs> I'm going to be out of the country on these days, right? There are reasons why you sometimes can't keep up. And if you talk to me about it, then, then usually I'll waive any late penalties. Completing the projects. Well, we don't have any particular projects in this class, so we're just going to say that, that uh, that's wrapped up into getting your assignments in on time. What am I responsible for? Course content, a course schedule. Sometimes people hand me a form, you know, that they filled out at the uh, ADA office at the Learning Resource Center. The course schedule is always posted in this in Canvas. You'll always be able to click assignments and see due dates for everything. And if you need something more specific than that, then uh, I will provide that for you as well. Usually we kind of make it up as we go along. Every homework assignment I give is usually due a week after we assign it. Right, so like on Monday if I give you homework, I want you to have it done by Monday the following week. Now if we have a break, if I'm so silly as to forget to assign a due date, I'm not going to go back and make it due like tomorrow, right? You know, if I figure out on Sunday that I should have made it due Monday and I forgot to tag a due date on it, heaven forbid, then, uh, you know, I'll put extra time on it because it's not fair for you to walk in Monday, see that due date and go, oh man, I missed it, right? So, general though, plan for a week to do work. Cheating. Hate to talk about cheating, but it, yet again, it happened last semester. Not in fundamentals though. Um, how can you cheat in a course like this? Well, during an exam, you could open up, you know, Google Chat or something like that and be asking somebody else for help. You're not going to do that. I hate having to be the bad guy in control from this computer trying to catch you being, being, being naughty folks, right? Because in a class where you can ask a professor for help during an exam and you have open books and stuff like that, you shouldn't have to resort to things like that. What's another way you could cheat? What if I couldn't figure something out? So I said, yo, how? How did you do that? Oh man, could you just text me your program? I need to just figure out the last thing. Not text, email, whatever, right? And so you email me the program and I just upload it to the prof, right? I hadn't even written it, I was, I was BSing you. Know? And then maybe I'm so silly to even forget to remove your name. Yes, I've had that happen, um, right? And then you get in trouble because I uploaded your program because I don't have any proof that, you know, that, uh, you know, right, you know. Or maybe they even got on your computer and, and copied the files, off. right? It, it's a real drag. Academic integrity is a big deal. Got cheating, you get an F for the class. And a record of the incident will be given to the school. It's a real drag. So don't do it. What's another way you could cheat? Well, you could ask somebody else to write your program for you. Don't do that. Not going to really be able to ask anybody to take your exams for you. On an online course, people used to try to get away with that, but nowadays online courses require you to either go to the library to take the class at the testing center or with a proctor service. In a proctor service, you have to have a camera with your computer. And that would make me nervous watching, you know, knowing that if they were watching what I was typing and had a camera on me, I'd rather just take it at the library. But some people take long distance courses and you're not from Zimbabwe or or, you know, and don't come, aren't anywhere near, and so they have to do it that way. All right, so what am I responsible for? 
This is like the most important one. I better be explaining things clearly. Because if I'm not, you have a legitimate complaint. And yeah, this is easier for some people than it is for others. But I will always go over a topic again if you ask me for help, right? And I will meet up with you at office hours or I'll come in on Fridays and I'll certainly text you. The reason, the best reason for having my phone number is that if you're stuck on a programming problem, there's no reason to give up. There's no reason to say, okay, I'll ask him next class period. Just text a picture of your code. Kind of make it a clear one, right? If it's blurry, I'm not going to be able to read it, right? And say, it's not doing it, right? And then I'll probably ask you to text me a picture of the output window as well so I can see the error message, right? Low, I'm going to induce an error in my code, right? And so if you show me that as well, send me two texts, picture of your code, picture of the error, and I can usually immediately tell you what's wrong. It might be more complicated than that. It might take us some bouncing messages back and forth. But I'm up until you know 2 p.m. every night, any 2 a.m. every night, anyways. You're not going to wake me up. And if you do wake me up, it's because I was dumb enough to forget to silence my phone. So you know my shade, not yours. Don't ever be shy about texting me for help. The students who ask me for help and are usually the, you know more successful in the class than those who don't. So please don't feel shy about that. All right, so we're not doing chapter assignments, so that does not apply. I actually need to edit this. Sorry about that change from last semester. But in general, I do not accept homework that's more than a month late. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of time, but you would not believe how many people wait until the end of the semester and they want to do an entire semester worth of work in one week. So, you know, a month is the cutoff. Don't wait that long, right? I'll give you a week grace period, but you know, before you start getting deductions. But but don't don't push it, right? You know, because if you forget to do it, it's gonna be a real drag. So let's see here. I don't remember where that was. We also use a website called How to Think Like a Computer Scientist. At one time I taught entirely using this website and requiring no physical textbook at armor or no mind tap at all. But then the class set it upon a standard, and so yeah, I, I meet the standard. But yeah, it's kind of an alternate textbook, just entirely online. And I like the way it's lined out, but it's Python specific. It's not programming concepts specific. So it really doesn't fit the need for a fundamentals of programming logic, but it's certainly good for learning Python. So if you feel like working ahead, you can just start scrolling through here and picking out chapters and typing in their examples and stuff like that, right? I will be hitting this from time to time in order to you know, reinforce concepts, especially since our textbook is not a Python specific. It has Python examples, but right, it, it's not written entirely for Python. Is that about it? What are you going to turn in? Well, at the end of each class, like I said, you're going to either upload the code that you typed in if you did, or just a note saying you were here. And so you know, that, that's good enough. If you miss the day, then you're going to want to uh, fill out the video review form, which I think may not be in the home and the modules link yet. I'll put it there. It'll be right there on the class information video review form. All it does is ask you to, to you know, name four things that you learned from it and which lecture you watched. And so you'll upload that into the folder because we have a folder for each day. The folders will be named lecture A, lecture B, lecture C, and so on. Why don't we go ahead and create that? just so that you can go ahead and do that and we don't have to rush at the end of the class. So this is week one. And eventually the lecture A folder after I upload the video will have a link to the video as well. So you know that'll be how you find it. You just click on that. Also we have a playlist for the class so you'll just you know, you can go to the playlist and find it just as easily that way. And I always set the due date for the lecture of the day of the lecture, but that doesn't mean that if you miss a lecture, oh man, I'm going to get points counted off because I wasn't here Jan 22, right? You know, due date is just to mark it, right? Not, not that you're going to get points deducted for not meeting it. So that's what you need for your lectures, just to upload something like that. However, your homework you're going to be uploading your Python file into screenshot. There are like 8 billion different ways of taking screenshots. 
you probably already know a way of taking screenshots. I'm going to show you one way just to make sure, just to cover everybody knowing how to take a screenshot. And of course, it's different for the Mac users still, but you know how to do it and you can Google it. I think I'll post a document over that to help. But there's also something called the snipping tool in Windows 10. And it's yet another way of taking screenshots. And it's kind of cool because it lets you crop as you take it. So that's kind of cool. You can use the snipping tool. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the way that works on every install of Windows all the way back to like Windows 3 in 1989. And that's to hit the print screen button. There's always a print screen button on your laptop or your, or, or your, you know, your keyboard. It's uh, usually in the upper right corner. And on my particular keyboard here, it's like, you know, here. But anyways, find your print screen button. It doesn't actually print the screen, right? It doesn't trigger a printer, but it copies the screen into the computer's buffer so that you can then open Paint or Word or WordPad and paste it and save it, right? So every Windows computer has WordPad, even if you don't have Word, or every computer has Paint installed. Either one will work just fine. So now that it's in the buffer, I can paste it. I don't see a paste menu option. I don't know why Paint doesn't have it. So just memorize the keystroke for it. Control V. You may wonder why V means paste. They did that just to put it next to the C, which means copy, right? Oh, look at that. It didn't show up. Didn't I hit the print screen button and, and copy it? Uh, I'll be really embarrassed. Oh, man. This is the first time I've seen this. New keyboard. To get print screen to work on my keyboard, I'm going to have to hold that function key down. So if you have the same keyboard I do, you have to hold the blue function key down while pressing the insert print screen button. Then I can paste it. Yeah, there. And if you want to take the time to crop it, I wouldn't bother, right? It takes extra time. If you feel like cropping it, you can. And then just save it. Now, you're not going to do this for lectures after this. This is just to show you how to do it, right? Because, what, you know, you want to get to your next class. Why take a screenshot? But, uh, right, and I'm going to call it Lecture A, Screenshot, or something like that. You don't even have to call it Screenshot. And then upload that with your homework assignment as well. Now, why do I do that? Just so that you, you can prove that you got the program working, right? You didn't just copy code from somewhere and you know, upload it. A couple of points about grading homework is that if it doesn't run, you don't get credit for it. If you don't have a screenshot for it, it's probably because it doesn't run, and so you're not going to get credit for it. What do I mean it doesn't run? Syntax errors, like that one. The program didn't run. If you get syntax errors, text me about it. Don't submit it with a syntax error, right? Because I can't test it, right? The code's broken. It's like handing me, you know, a broken car and expecting me to drive to Walmart in it. Can't do it. So I, I would need to fix the syntax. You would need to fix the syntax errors. Now. If you have a screenshot that shows the program ran, and then I test it and it's got a syntax error, then I'll take a moment and try to figure out, oh, I guess a space got added to it, right, you know, before you send it, because obviously you had it working, and, and we can figure it out. So if that happens, and you get a 0 or a 0 0.1 on the assignment or something, don't, don't get bummed. All it is is a subtle hint that you're going to have to go in and actually upload a good version of the program. And I will put a comment to that effect. I will say, yeah. here's what's wrong with the program. Please correct it and upload it for more credit. Quite often, I'll give you full credit for it, right? You know, once you fix the problem, quite often, I'll give you full credit for it. So that might be a reason to go ahead and even if you're not done with the assignment, upload the what you got done so far. But if you do that, put a comment to that effect. Don't let me find that out only by testing it, right, that the program is not done. So why don't we go ahead and upload our code. You ought to be able to go here. Hopefully, you can click on Lecture A, and I haven't messed anything up. Let me slip into student mode so I see exactly what you see. Modules, Lecture A, 
submit assignment, choose file. And in this particular case, since I have a screenshot, I'm going to want to upload two files. If you have multiple files, please upload them all at the same time just because Canvas gets a little bit weird about showing me files when they're uploaded at different times. If you don't, it's not a disaster. But it's better to pick one file, then choose Add Another File, and pick that one as well if you're uploading multiple files. See, it's not showing extensions. Maybe I disabled the showing of extensions and I didn't mean to. Hmm. I wonder how I did that. I'll fix that. It's very useful to see .py, right, versus .png. All right, now I'm going to upload. So click Submit Assignment. All well and good, it's done. So like I said, you should be able to get partial credit even if you don't get it totally working right. Now, if you made like no effort at getting it to work right at all, like you just copied the notes that we did for that day and uploaded it as homework, uh, partial credits could be very small, right? But if you made an earnest effort at it and it, you know, like it doesn't produce the right output, I wanted it to calculate the value of pi and it prints out one, you know, okay, well, let's look at your formula. You get half credit for it because everything else was right, right? Something like that. But if you only get partial credit for something, unless it's like a late penalty, revise it. Upload it, get more credit. The only exception would be is if I gave you a zero on it for you know academic integrity issues. So, all right, anything else we need to cover? I think we are about done for the day. Good thing too, because I think we're about out of time for the day. Oh, and lastly, the syllabus addendum. Every class has a link to this in their syllabus, so you may have seen it before. I think this is pretty cool. There's free counseling available to you, and it's awesome because it's free, but it's also awesome because they're actually good. And so if you have things going on in your life that are affecting your, you know, your academic career, you're getting behind in, in assignments or something, stuff, you know, or even if it's not, right, anything that's difficult, you can go and talk to them. I highly recommend them. Plus, if you're feeling stressed once a month, they bring up a bunch of puppies to that same room and you can play with them. If you're kidding, then that's funny. If it's true, that's pr awesome. No, they uh, brought us there last semester. Oh, you're floor, kidding. That's and, cool. Uh, they showed us a calendar where you can see when they're bringing up the puppies. Puppy so, therapy. Yeah. That's cool. All therapy. <laughs> that's cool. All right. And then the student handbook. I know the student handbook is approximately 800 pages long, but it's still worth scrolling through to, you know, fig, um, at least see like a list of topics, right? And so you know, okay, if I need to withdraw for something or I have an incomplete on my, you know, or whatever, then uh, you, you know that you can go to the student's handbook and, and read about it. Okay, I lied, it's 96 pages. I think we're done for today. Looks like I didn't assign any homework. The first homework assignment I always give, and I call it homework zero, is to install Python. Since I didn't copy that in here this time, then you're not officially on the clock for it. But why not get it done anyways? Over the weekend, just go to python.org and do downloads and download for Windows if you're on Windows or you know Mac or you know, Linux or whatever. And so hopefully it'll go real clean. When I have the Dropbox created for it, all I'm going to ask you to do is pop up, pop open idle and take a screenshot, right? Not even write a program that time. So that'll be the first homework assignment. I'll get that uploaded over the weekend and it'll be due Wednesday because like I said, I never get less than a week for homework. But get it done over the weekend anyways. Any questions? I hope you'll like the class. Yes, sir. Oh, I was just curious, like, whenever we log off, will our data still be saved? Something? Very good question. If I log off, is my data saved? Yes, until it crashes and they replace your computer. So, yeah, some computers on ca uh, on this floor erase themselves every, every time you log off. But these maintain your data. And the other students can't get to your files, right? Each one saves into their own directory. So. So you're good to go. It's free to, it, it's, it's fine to save your data here and hope that it's here next time. And, and the majority of time it is. But I wouldn't, do, I wouldn't stake my life on it. All right, any other questions? Uh, do we have to use idle to edit your No, code? no, if you, there are lots of ways of writing Python programs. 
pick any one of them that you want. So, are you familiar with another one, or? The only other one I've ever used was uh, Jupiter. Yeah, yeah, you can use that. You can use Visual Studio, Eclipse, NetBeans. You can use one of the online editors. There's eight billion of them, and I'm happy with any of them. So, so that's all cool. All righty, let's stop the recording and get it going up.